breakfast this morning. Scrambled eggs. We wanted to know how often do astronauts wash their clothes in space? Uh, ich glaube, die haben so uh, Wegwerfunterwäsche, so Papierunterwäsche, wie ältere uh, Leute auch. Yeah. I think uh, an astronaut will never have to wash his, uh, wash his or her clothes because um, because it is weightless and all, all dust. There is no dust on, in the universe. So I think never will, will he have to. Fumé à mon avis peu quoi. Ça doit sentir très mauvais là dedans. Allez cinq fois. No, no comprendo nada. No lo sé, no lo sé porque además eh, no no puedo, no creo que puedan tener. Yo no sé es que no sé si pueden llevar agua en el espacio. Pueden llevar agua en el espacio, no no estoy muy seguro. Pueden. Oh, that's not idea. <laughs> Go now. Nah. <laughs> in fact, astronauts do not wash their clothes in space. The reason is simple. On the ISS, which is currently the only outpost of humanity in space, very little water is produced. It is partly derived from the used-up breathing air and partly recycled from the urine of the astronauts. And here is where the water comes back out again. It is mainly used for rehydrating the dry food the astronauts eat in space. Fresh linens are delivered to the astronauts via supply ships like the fully automatic ATV module. Together with other essential materials and the laundry, it also includes most of the water for the ISS. Consumed laundry and other waste is brought back in sacks to the ATV module. Together with all the other waste, it burns up on re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. This, of course, is not the case for the heavy and very expensive spacesuits. They are returned to Earth, where they are cleaned and serviced for reuse in space. Astronauts are released from such earthly activities like doing their laundry. Hello, it's uh, almost time to go to sleep here on ISS. So I thought I would show you where we actually sleep. Four of us sleep here in Node 2, and uh, two more crew members have their sleeping stations in, uh, in the Russian segment. We have uh, two crew quarters on the walls, so to speak. One is up there on the ceiling, and my own is down here on the floor. But of course, it doesn't really matter. There is no up and down in space. It's just a convention. We talk about overhead, deck, port, and starboard crew quarters. As I said, it's past midnight. I'm already in my pajamas, and it's time to turn off the light and go to sleep. Come on, I'll give you a tour. As you can see, there isn't a whole lot of space in here. Um, it's really just the space for, for our sleeping bag and for us to sleep. Uh, and then for a few personal items and stuff of, uh, of regular use. Um, most importantly, we have two laptops in here. Um, this is one of uh, many laptops that we have throughout the station called SSCs. Uh, each one of us has a personal SSC in their uh, crew quarters. We can use it to read our emails, um, but also, for example, to pull up stuff like our um, electronic uh, agenda, the electronic schedule, where we can see um, for example, I can take a look and see what activities I will be doing tomorrow. And if I want, I can um, look in detail, pull up all the information about each activity. Uh, but there's also on these computers um, applications that are more for our personal life up here. Like, for example, there is an application that allows us to use the 
a voice over IP system to uh, talk on the phone, so to speak, with um, anybody on the planet. So we can uh, call our friends and family that way, and we usually do that here in our crew quarters. And we also have a, a second laptop, which is called a CSL laptop. And uh, this one is uh, disconnected from the onboard uh, uh, network. And with this one, we can uh, log in into a machine on the ground and uh, this way have access to the internet. It's uh, not super fast. And of course, it's subject to interruptions depending on the satellite coverage. But it's kind of a neat thing to have, to be able to have access on, to the internet from the space station. And then I have a few, you know, personal common use items in here. I have my, my clothes, um, the sport clothes and the, and the regular clothes that I have been, that I've been wearing this, uh, this week. Um, my personal camera, my iPad, some snacks, uh, water, a flashlight can come in handy. Um, we also all have a speaker in our crew quarters that only transmits uh, an alarm in case of an emergency in the space station. And of course we have our sleeping bag. I usually roll it up during the day so that it's not in my way and then when it's time to sleep I open it up and then I can slide in. Some people leave it open but I'm, uh, I'm always a little bit cold so I like to zip it up <coughs> all the way. Some people like to um, tie themselves, but uh, I actually don't. I really like to just float when I'm sleeping, so that's really it. I would uh, turn the light off and uh, good night. Every morning I wake up. I wonder what I'm going to do. And also, I wonder who I am and who I'm going to be. One may think it's hard to focus on yourself in such a different context, a context out of this world. Well, it's not. It comes quite natural indeed. Who am I? A spaceman? A French astronaut? No, I'm a man, together with other men and women, on a trip of discovery. And like every trip, it leads to discover yourself more than other places. And for some reason, it takes all of this technology for us to come up here and understand the simplicity of things. The Earth the cosmos and life itself as a unity. And from here it's really difficult to understand borders, wars and hate. Sometimes these thoughts are a bit overwhelming. At least until you go to sleep again. Situated in West Central Scotland, this city is the largest in the country. Today, we look at Glasgow, host of the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of Parties, COP26. Welcome to Earth from Space. Glasgow lies along both banks of the River Clyde, the ninth longest river in the United Kingdom and the third longest in Scotland. 
The city occupies much of the lower Clyde Valley and its suburbs extend into the surrounding districts. Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, is located in Lothian, on the southern shore of the Firth of Forth. Both Edinburgh and Glasgow, along with Stirling and Dundee, lie in the central lowlands, where over half of Scotland's population lives. The Highlands is the largest region in Scotland, covering more than 25,600 square kilometres of land and is home to stunning scenery. It is divided in two parts. The Great Glen divides the Grampian Mountains to the southeast from the Northwest Highlands. The area is very sparsely populated, with many mountain ranges dominating the region, and includes the highest mountain in the British Isles, Ben Nevis, as well as the legendary Loch Ness. From the 31st of October to the 12th of November, the COP26 summit will take place in Glasgow bringing together parties to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. As in previous years, ESA will have a strong presence at COP26. ESA's theme at COP26 will be taking the pulse of the planet from space and supporting climate action, which aims to demonstrate the role of ESA's missions and satellite data to strengthen our understanding of climate from space. This will support policymakers, society, businesses and communities to mitigate and adapt to a changing climate and develop resilience in support of the UNFCC Paris Agreement. During COP26, the much-anticipated documentary which covers the ESA-led science expedition to the Gorner Glacier in Switzerland will be released for the first time. The documentary follows ESA astronaut Luca Parmitano along with Susanne Mecklenburg, head of ESA's climate office, and their scientific team, to one of the biggest ice masses in the Alps, the Gorner Glacier. Owing to its dramatic retreat, the glacier is one of the most extensively studied glaciers in the world. Gina is an avid photographer. Whenever the sun is shining brightly, Gina captures the best moments and takes the most perfect pictures. After sunset, Gina brings her own light to illuminate the scene and make obscure things visible. John is a doctor. If he wants to see things inside a human body, he uses an X-ray machine or an ultrasound scanner. The scanner generates harmless sound waves, which are reflected by the body's tissue creating a blurry image of our body's interior. For instance, the first picture of an unborn baby. <coughs> Captain Tom is always on duty, as is the radar scanner on his cargo vessel. Day and night, in all weathers, even in the densest fog, Tom can see everything around him with his radar eyes. That's because radar equipment generates radio waves, which are reflected by solid objects, such as ships, coastlines, lighthouses, and even lost containers in the sea. Gina's photo flash, John's hospital equipment, and Captain Tom's radar all bring their own sources of light, enabling them to look into something we wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye. Sarah knows that. She's a proud user of images from an Earth observation radar satellite in space. It's called Sentinel-1 from the European Copernicus program, and she's amazed what these radar satellites can make visible. For instance, in case of severe weather, Sarah stays on top of things. When it's pouring rain, Sentinel-1 can easily spot rising water levels and the beginning of floods over land areas, even through the clouds. There's no better tool for calling rescue teams into action. Just as easily, Sentinel-1 can monitor the oceans and their ice sheets over a long period of time and tell us about wave heights, potentially dangerous for ships and offshore wind farms or about oil pollution leaked from platforms and vessels on the seas. And it shows where the pack ice has grown too thick for even the heaviest icebreakers, or detect large ice sheets growing thin and porous due to global warming. 
simply by watching the ice from space and sending high-resolution images down to the ground. Or look at radar images of cornfields and rice paddies. They show crop growth around the world and help in forecasting the total yield. With half of the world's population eating rice every day, the difference between a bountiful and a poor rice harvest can be enormous. With all these radar images, Sentinel-1 can help save lives before real disasters happen. Just as John can help his patients before they fall ill or get pregnant. Hmm. It's just amazing what all these invisible rays and beams can do to make our lives safer and more enjoyable. We need radar satellites because we cannot limit ourselves to optical satellites which are impaired by cloud, by bad weather. Radar satellites have the unique advantage to operate during day and during night time and even weather independently. What Copernicus is doing is doing exactly what we do for weather forecast operationally for many years, but for other domains, for environmental monitoring, for disaster management, for climate change monitoring, for agriculture, for forestry and similar domains. All this information is bundled together and sent out to the member states. And this all within 30 minutes, which is an extremely fast satellite service. The user is in the driving seat. The user is defining what information he needs, uh, at what time, in what format, at what frequency. And we as a space agency deliver this information based on these needs of the users. There are two main applications. The one is the Clean CNET oil spill monitoring and vessel detection service. And uh, the others are the maritime surveillance uh, services, which are focusing primarily on uh, vessel detection. EMSA is using the satellite images to detect uh, potential spills on European waters. People uh, along the coastline are dependent on the environment on the coastline. And uh, to try to reduce the impact of oil beaching at the coastline is tremendous. I have been working for so long on this uh, program and uh, it will be a fantastic uh, uh, system which we are building up really for the benefit of mankind, for the benefit of citizens uh, in Europe. It's just a big step uh, when you see the satellite, the rocket is launching and you can expect in, in the next half a year to receive then the images you were working uh, for a long time for. Space is not a luxury. Space is essential uh, for everyone's uh, daily life. Uh, we have done some uh, estimates of socio-economic benefits of Copernicus and these studies which have been done by independent organizations say that if you invest one euro in the program, the economic benefit for the European Union will be 10 euros for one euro invested. So it's a one to 10 ratio. Personally, if I would have this uh, return on my private investment, I would not be unhappy.
hab's mitgekriegt, dass ich da wieder da bin. Ja. All over Europe, climate change is a growing concern, with global sea levels rising between 16 and 20 centimeters since 1900. Climate change is undeniably having an effect on oceans, land surfaces, ice caps, and weather patterns across the globe. It is well understood that climate change is caused by atmospheric gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane. When we look at these trace gases, there is an obvious correlation between human activity and climate change. What you see here on this graph is the CO2 concentrations uh, of the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. And you see that these values are going up and down uh, in different uh, phases. You see on the, the blue lines here are indicating ice ages and the orange lines here are indicating periods between ice ages or periods where it's much warmer. But you also see that over the last 800,000 years, the value was always below 300 parts per million. And suddenly, since the last century, it goes up very steep towards 400 parts per million or even beyond. Uh, and this is what we, what we have today. This is the increase of carbon dioxide uh, drastically increasing over the last uh, 100 years caused by human beings. In order to tackle climate change, scientists and governments need reliable data to understand how our planet is changing. This can be provided by ESA, which monitors our planet from space. With four EU Copernicus Sentinel missions and four Earth Explorer missions in orbit, ice thickness and coverage, deforestation, soil moisture, sea level and ocean surface temperature, as well as other essential climate variables can be measured. These satellites have global coverage, revisiting the same region every few days therefore providing a good understanding of the health and behavior of our planet and how it's affected by climate change. In turn, this offers decision makers key information for mitigating strategies and policies. Frequency and consistent observations of our environment are very important if we want to give decision makers the key into their hand on where humankind has to change practices where we have to be mitigating for encroaching impacts on our environment. Satellites can show us how the world has changed. Like here in the Camargue, France, where the coastline has retreated more than 200 meters in the last 20 years. In the 1980s, sea walls were constructed here in a failed attempt to stop the rising water. Back then, sea level was rising, but more slowly than it is now. Over the last five years, records show that the rise in sea level is accelerating. Soon, part of this delta will be lost to the sea. And what is happening here is happening in many parts of the globe. Worldwide, more than 370 million people live less than five meters above sea level. 
Over a hundred megacities such as New York or Tokyo are near the water. All are at risk. Satellite data gives us the facts so that we can prepare ourselves for the rising tide and protect coastline populations. This data is also used in ESA's Climate Change Initiative, where ESA scientists preserve and work with long-term data sets going back to 30 years and more to get an even better understanding of climate change. Thanks to satellites, we have evidence that the planet is in danger. Now it is up to people on Earth to take the necessary measures in time. The key for sustaining life on Earth might come from space.